You're watching Disney Channel. Do you think you got what it takes to be a high school freshman? Here are the top five things you need to know from your eighth grade year. Five. Number five is natural selection. And natural selection is the process of nature weeding out or removing negative traits in organisms over a long period of time. When we look at natural selection, there are three factors that greatly influence a species' ability to change. And that is variation, competition, and overproduction. Those factors need to be present in order to push a species to advancement. We're gonna be looking at the common Ohio water snake, which I failed to catch, it went right through my fingers, and a largemouth bass, both of which of these creatures are adept water-based predators. They are voracious, tough, mean, streamlined, fast, and they are great at what they do. Those traits, because they are so successful, will be passed on to offspring. They'll stay dark colored, they will stay aggressively streamlined, fast, muscular builds, and even defense mechanisms like the musk scent that the water snake can create when predators are near will all be passed down because those are the traits that made it successful. And successful traits getting passed down through millions of years cause this adaption in animal species. Four. The fourth most important thing in your eighth grade year is talking about Punnett squares and Mendelian traits. As a quick overview, we had a couple words that were really confusing. We had genotype versus phenotype. And then we had this idea of predicting traits of offspring. Well, I want to look at wide versus narrow feet. Yeah. Wide versus narrow feet. I happen to have really wide feet. Because we're going to say that N is going to be the dominant allele, and it's going to represent that narrow foot. The lowercase n would be the recessive trait in carrying that gene for a wide foot. So let's look at the genotypes we possibly can have and what the phenotypes could be. Now, genotypes was that pairing of alleles, or the letters. Don't let that word confuse you too much. We have three options when we look at these two dominant and recessive alleles. We have capital N, capital N, capital N, lowercase n, and then we have lowercase n, lowercase n. Now, when I go to phenotype, phenotype is the physical trait that is expressed. So is the foot wide or is the foot narrow? That's what we're writing in phenotype. Capital, capital is two dominants. We said dominant alleles were a narrow foot. A dominant and a recessive, anytime there's one dominant, your dominant allele will show we're gonna have narrow feet. And if you're like me, you have two recessive lowercase n's for wide feet. I'm like a hobbit. Now let's check out the pipe square as if my parents were both big n, little n, or heterozygous. Both parents being heterozygous are having capital N, lowercase n. Hetero means different, so we're going to have a capital N, a lowercase. Homo means the same. So anytime I say homozygous, it means the same letters. Anytime it's heterozygous, it means there's one capital one, lowercase. So when we go through the Punnett squared, what we're doing is we're not predicting direct outcomes of offspring, but instead we're predicting the probability of having a particular trait. So here we have talking about wide versus narrow feet. I want to go to this box first. It's these two contributing. I get big N, big N. Here I get big N, little N, big N, little N, and then two little Ns. So each quadrant on this Punnett square represents a 25% chance of having this trait expressed. It does not mean that one of your kids, if you had four of them, will have this, but on probability, it would. Just like flipping a coin is 50% chance heads versus tails, yet you might flip it five times in a row and get tails every time. So it's probability. So there's a 25% chance a homozygous dominant NN or a narrow foot. There is a 50% chance of having a narrow foot heterozygous. And there's a 25% chance of being homozygous recessive, being a wide foot. Three. So I brought you guys to a very specific place for the number three most important thing you need to know as an eighth grade student heading to high school. Here is a river cut bank. In fact, a pretty steep one, a pretty tall one. This is all shale rock behind me. 
and this stream is bending. Now what happens when a stream bends is that the speed of the water on the outside gets faster than the speed of the water on the inside. And over millions of years, it's able to carve down rocks, break down rock, create cliff faces. So the number three thing is constructive and destructive forces. Constructive forces in the world build things up and destructive forces break things down. Think about erosion. Now, there's a whole bunch of factors in this, but I wanna bring out one important player and that's water. And that's why I brought you to a stream because water has an amazing ability to both destruct things or erode things like this cliff bank, but also build things up because every time this river flows, it's taking particles that it broke to somewhere else and it's gonna build that area up. So remember, constructive is building up, destructive is tearing down, and water is darn good at this game. Two. So I'm here with two pieces of rocks on a log and I'm here to talk to you about the second most important thing about your eighth grade year, and that is plate tectonics. So the earth is made up of these layers and the top layer being the crust or the lithosphere, which has the crust in the upper part of the mantle. And it's this hard rock, right? Go outside, jump up and down. You don't sink through because there's rocks underneath your feet. And so we have these rocks and there are three types of plate boundaries when we're talking about plate tectonics. Now, the first one would be convergent plate boundaries. And that's when forces inside the earth fueled by the convection in the mantle are driving plates into one another. They're crashing into one another, they're pushing in, and what happens in result is a lot of stress, a lot of earthquakes, and a lot of the times, mountain building events. So the forces, this compressive force, pushes these rock plates together very slowly, but with a ton of force, and pushes them upwards. The second plate boundary is called a divergent plate boundary, and that is when plates pull apart from one another. So the forces are going in this direction and in that direction, splitting or separating these pieces of crust. This commonly happens in the oceans and we get to see new earth being made at mid-ocean ridges. It can cause rift zones or big kind of like valleys when rocks are being pulled apart. The force for this would be tension. And the last plate boundary is called a transform boundary. And that is when plates slide past each other in this fashion. So this is resulting of shearing stress causing a strike slip or plate motion that is in this direction. Now think about this, there is not any verticality to this. There does not have to be any verticality to this. It is only being slid back like this direction. Those are the three plate boundaries. The three stresses that were important for those were compressive tension and shearing stress. One. Is understanding net forces and Newton's second law. They kind of are attached together. So here I'm an example of some net forces. So Rogue and I are pulling in opposite directions. There's a force arrow that goes this direction and a force arrow that goes in his direction. Right now, because no, neither of us are moving, we're in a stalemate, which means we have a balanced force. An unbalanced force was co would cause something to move. So when we do net forces, remember, when we look at a diagram, anytime the arrows are running in the same direction, you add those forces together. Anytime they have an opposite direction, you subtract or take the difference. Think about it. If we're pulling like this in opposite directions, and then I change and immediately go the same direction Rogue is going, all of a sudden, we're gonna make this thing move. But, if I wanna just increase my force, I can make him move as long as my force is bigger than his force. Ready? Come on, come on. Like such, and therefore I win tug of war. In the idea of forces, I chose Newton's second law as another really important factor for you as you head into the high school. Newton's second law is all about how a force can create acceleration in an object. Now, it gives us a great equation, F equals MA. Here in front of me, I have a drawing that I worked entirely too long on of your new red Porsche. So in your Porsche, your Porsche weighs 1,600 kilograms, and it accelerates in this direction at 18 meters per second squared. 
With those variables given, we can solve for the amount of force that is required to meet those parameters using that equation. Let's check it out on the board. So our sports car question has led us to the board. And we want to figure out what is the force required to move this Porsche and you at a mass of 1,600 kilograms at an acceleration of 18 meters per second squared. Well, luckily, we have a great triangle for that. And this triangle is a force triangle, and it has all three variables in our second law equation. Now, using this, I can derive any of the equations for any of the variables by just covering up what I'm looking to solve. So I want to solve for force, so I cover force up, and I'm left with mass times acceleration. F is equal to ma. I can cover mass up, and I can get F divided by a. And I can cover a up and get F divided by M. That is a crucial way of breaking down a three variable equation so that you can easily derive it without having to rely on your algebraic ability. For our circumstance, we just need this equation F equals MA. The variables we had was M, 1600 kgs, A, 18 meters per second squared. When I insert those into this equation, I get F is equal to 1600 times 18 meters per second squared. The final answer is this is going to require a force of 28,800 newtons. Those are the top five things that you need to know as an eighth grade student as you head on to the ninth grade. Obviously, there are so many more things that we did learn this year, but those are some things that I felt were exceptionally crucial. I'm gonna list those back up right here, right now. Other than that, have a great weekend. See ya.